So I'll be talking about some aspects of my recent book, and particularly this uh, thorny question of the silence of Pope Pius XII uh, as Europe's Jews were being exterminated by the uh, Germans. The genesis of the book goes back a uh, way. It has a kind of dual history in a fashion as I look back on it. One is a kind of personal one, and the other is a more scholarly. Uh, personal has to do with the fact that as a child, I heard these stories about Italy during the war for my father, who was a chaplain in the US Army. And he was a rabbi. And uh, he was with the troops who landed in Anzio Beachhead. In, uh, they landed there in January 1944 and would be pinned down until uh, late May and then early June. He was with them the day they liberated Rome. Uh, so as I say, I, from an early age, heard stories about some of this history. Uh, but of course, there are more academic, historical reasons for an interest. This is uh, one of the most controversial topics, certainly in modern European history, uh, has to do with the uh, silence of the Pope during the, the Holocaust. And just to give uh, some remind, some of you may be familiar with some of this, but uh, it was kicked off in a way by the uh, 1963 play by the German uh, playwright Ralph Hachluth. Uh, the deputy was forbidden in Italy, so could not be performed there, but was performed throughout uh, much of the rest of the world. And uh, that uh, portrayed a pope who, despite pleas, including from other Catholic clergy, uh, refused to uh, speak out against the Holocaust as it was happening. Reacting to that, I put in the middle there uh, these 12 volumes. The uh, Pope Paul VI, reacting to this controversy, uh, called on four Jesuit historians to go into the Vatican archives, which at that point were closed to the rest of us, and uh, theoretically choose all relevant documents there relevant to this question of the Pope or the Vatican more generally in World War II, and to publish them to make them accessible, even though the Vatican archives weren't open. These were published between 1965, you see, and 1981. And according to uh, some defenders, you might say, of Pius XII, uh, these made it really unnecessary uh, for the, uh, the archives to be open more generally, because they said, well, we've published all the, you know, the relevant documents. As we'll see, it turns out that was not the case. Uh, then you see, more recently, I think 1999, was the book by John Cornwell, which became a bestseller. Hitler's Pope, obviously a quite provocative uh, title. So you had, on the one hand, uh, as we'll see, the Pope's defenders who portray the Pope as a heroic, courageous figure who um, worked efficiently behind the scenes to save millions of Jews. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, the Hitler's Pope, the idea that uh, at the other extreme, the Pope was basically uh, did the work of, of Hitler for him. Um, as uh, you'll see, my own view is neither extreme, if we put it that way. Well, when um, we've been, the scholars have been pressing the Vatican, not the scholars, but also Jewish organizations, pressing the Vatican to open the archives for the papacy of Pius XII. So Pius XII was pope from uh, 19th, early 1939, March 1939, until his death in 1958. And uh, so this whole question of, of the war years in the Vatican, uh, the records remained uh, inaccessible to the scholarly community. Uh, finally, uh, it was Francis, Pope Francis announced in 2019 that the following year, finally, th those archives would be open. Uh, but I had made a kind of bet, because I'd done a earlier book um, that was mentioned, The Pope of Mussolini, which came out originally in 2014. Uh, which dealt with his predecessor, Pius XI, and his relationship with the fascist regime, with Mussolini and the fascist regime. And in fact, throughout the 1930s, the number two man to Pius XI, Eugenio Pacelli, is the man who then succeeds him as Pius XII. So I'd already been uh, quite interested in the figure of Pacelli. And so uh, as I, the bet I made was that with Francis's uh, much pronounced desire for greater transparency in the Vatican, that he'd be the one to finally open these archives. Uh, and the bet was this, that there already were many archives open that do uh, help us understand this history, because it's not just the Vatican archives you want to look at if you want to understand the history 
of the uh, Vatican and the Pope during uh, World War II. Uh, but the uh, archives in, uh, in Italy of the fascist regime, in, in Germany, in Berlin, in the US, in, in Britain, in France, because each of these places had their own ambassador and envoys to the Vatican who were uh, placed in the Vatican throughout the war years and were meeting with the people around the Pope as well as meeting with the Pope occasionally and sending back regular reports, multiple reports each week, in fact, throughout the war years to their governments, to Washington, to Berlin, so on, to Rome, um, recounting their conversations with the Pope and with the people around the Pope. So I spent uh, a number of years before the opening of the archives in 2020 um, and ended up with, in these other archives, in these other various countries, uh, and ended up with tens of thousands of pages of archival documents digitized that would be part of the basis for this book. Uh, well, there was great excitement when on March 2nd, 2020, the opening finally occurred of the Vatican archives. Here's a picture, if you see me there, looking over uh, this other gentleman in the front, the glasses is uh, Hubert Wolf, is a very prominent German historian, uh, as well as actually a Catholic priest. And yeah, I got to be number six there <laughs> uh, in the morning. I don't know, I should have elbowed my way to the front. He brought in this large group of German, this is the advantage German academics have over us poorer American academics. As a senior professor, he had seven kind of, uh, well, not flunkies, he had uh, seven uh, <laughs> disciples, I don't know, uh, who he could bring with him to help him do his work. Uh, but in any case, uh, but you might notice March 2nd, 2020, Italy. Does that bring to mind any, anything to any of you? Uh, so it turned out, after waiting you know, decades for the opening of these archives, that as I went uh, and I, I rented an apartment for several months, uh, beginning in, in uh, late February, um, and went on leave from Brown. Uh, and, but we were getting these reports uh, that uh, this new strange uh, virus that was around and it, as it turned out, at least after China, its epicenter was Italy, as some of you may recall. And so as it turned out, after the f one week there, so we worked, um, uh, and I have a, uh, a collaborator who works with me, an Italian uh, historian. Uh, we would work side by side for you know, the nine hours a day was open, the archives were open uh, for those five days, Monday to Friday. But Friday afternoon that same week, whatever that is, on the March uh, 6th, they pass around a piece of paper and say, the library will be closed until further notice. And um, initially, we didn't really know, you know, none of us knew what that really meant. So I'm biding our time. And then a few days later, each night, we're watching the, the news. The prime minister would come on, Conte. And uh, on the way, I think it was either the Tuesday or the Wednesday following, uh, we're watching the news, and he says, uh, you know, I said that uh, people are not supposed to go out. I meant it. And you're not allowed to leave your apartments. So it's nothing like the United States. I mean, people here complain about the you know, draconian restrictions. But <laughs> Italy, you weren't allowed to leave your apartment. Um, a lot of people, by the way, bought dogs. But that's another question. <laughs> uh, so we uh, ended up getting on a plane 12 hours later, which was kind of the last plane to leave for a while. Uh, fortunately, uh, as I mentioned, I have this Italian collaborator who's Roman, and the, they did reopen the archives in June, early June, so just three months later. And he, therefore, had an advantage not only over Americans and other foreigners who weren't able to travel to Italy, but in fact, the Italian restrictions that for many months after didn't allow other Italians, if they didn't live in the province of Rome, to actually uh, go across provincial uh, boundaries. So we got a kind of running head start, and we were in a kind of daily email and Zoom correspondence. So the result was, when it came time to, as I was writing my book, I ended up with about 8,000 pages of documents from those newly opened archives digitized that I was able to use uh, in preparing the book. Well, as I say, um, people said nothing very new, at least some people said nothing very new would come out of the, these newly opened archives. And it uh, turns out that's not true, not true at all. And um, one of the, actually one of my early scoops, and this was a little bit of a problem for me, 
Uh, one of the first, within a few months, we, what we discovered in the uh, Secretary of State archives, not these archives, but across the courtyard, there's a separate archive in the actual main apostolic building of the Secretary of State of the Vatican. Uh, we discovered this series of papers recounting the secret negotiations going on within weeks, beginning within weeks of Pius XII's election between the Pope and Hitler's personal emissary. Uh, negotiations that had been kept secret for 80 years. And when I, we first discovered these documents, I got in touch with my um, editor at Random House and said, you know, this is explosive stuff, it's incredible. Uh, and not only do we find these evidence, but we found basic transcripts of these meetings that they had in German, by the way, the Pope spoke German. Had spent 12 years as papal nuncio in Germany uh, before he became Secretary of State and then Pope. And so I, I said to my editor, you know, this can't, uh, I'm sure someone else is going to come across this, and I'd um, like to publish something, you know, perhaps in the Atlantic, where I've published a number of, of pieces in recent years. And my editor said, oh, absolutely not. You know, this is you know, <laughs> too uh, juicy for the book. And I said, well, it's juicy for the book if it's the first uh, you know, person, but it's, my book's not going to be published at that point for you know, a year and a half or something. So kind of amazingly, so he basically said, do not publish this in advance. So I spent uh, then the next many months you know, nervously you know, looking to see, did anybody else come across this and publish anything? Fortunately for me, they hadn't. So uh, this came, and, and the German edition of my book came out several months ago. And in Germany, this was kind of the lead story uh, that these negotiations went on. But that's just one example of uh, documents that were um, clearly um, purposely not published in those 12 volumes and kept secret all those years. But there were uh, many other, uh, I think, important documents that had not been published. And by the way, I also discovered that some of the documents that were published, uh, they took out, for example, anti-Semitic language and some other edits of that sort. Um, but so what I'd like to do in the, the time we have uh, this afternoon is to focus on what I think is the most telling example or tell telling uh, case which helps us understand and evaluate the silence of the Pope during the Holocaust. And that is the uh, Nazi roundup of the Jews of Rome on October 16th, 1943. And uh, this is something I, of course, talk about in my book. Uh, and I'll, those who've read the book, uh, some of this will certainly be familiar to you, but try to add some things I've discovered subsequently. Uh, so if you are those of you who are not, not as familiar with this history, uh, Mussolini is overthrown uh, shortly after the Allies land in Sicily in July of 1943. And then September 8th, 1943, the uh, new Italian government announces its armistice with the Allies. And immediately, uh, the Germans, the army, uh, floods through Italy and takes over almost all of uh, mainland peninsula, mainland Italy. Um, now that the Germans controlled, as of middle of September 1943, now that they controlled uh, most of Italy, they could add the attempt to murder the 45,000 Jews of Italy to their, uh, what they were already engaged in, the extermination of the Jews of Europe. Uh, by the way, in Rome, most of the Jews who lived in Rome, there were about 12,000 in the, the province of Rome at the time, uh, most were actually quite poor. In the north, uh, the Jews in general were, tend to be more prosperous, but the Jews in Rome tended to be a much more modest kind of occupations. In any case, on September 24th, this is just two weeks after the German occupation of Italy and the German occupation of Rome, uh, Heinrich Himmler, I okay, have a picture of him, Oh, there's, by the way, yeah, mention, oh, I did, what I didn't mention about Hitler's uh, personal envoy, Philip von Hessen, who, by the way, is a great grandson of Queen Victoria, of, uh, and related to all sorts of other familiar figures uh, that you would know about. Uh, but he was, had another advantage from Hitler's point of view. He was married to the daughter of, or one of the two daughters of the King of England at the time, Victor Emmanuel III, uh, Mafalda. Uh, who would die in a concentration camp, but that's a somewhat different story, German concentration camp after the 
Italian king turns against uh, Hitler and uh, overthrows Mussolini. So just two weeks after the German occupation of Rome, Himmler, uh, some of the editions out so far of the book, there he is, or Kapler, well, okay. So Himmler uh, sends his order to Kapler, who's head of the SS in Rome, and the order says the following, all Jews without regard to nationality, age, sex, or condition must be transferred to Germany and liquidated there. A uh, couple weeks after that, October 11th, Kapler received another telegram from Berlin, this one urging, quote, the immediate and complete elimination of Jewry in Italy. Additional members of the SS were then sent to Rome to help carry this out. So on that morning, early, very early before the sun came up, uh, that morning, October 16th, it was a, a Saturday, um, it was a cold, wet day uh, in Rome when hundreds, uh, 100 SS officers marched initially double file into the old ghetto of Rome. Now, now, not all the Jews, of course, by this time were living in the old ghetto, um, and another 265 SS went around other parts of Rome, each with uh, clipboards with the addresses, the names and addresses of all the Jews in Rome. They went door to door, um, taking the Jews from their households, and if they didn't answer the door, you know, breaking them in. Breaking them in. The Jews, when they um, first heard the commotion or looked out their windows and saw the Germans marching into their area, especially in the ghetto, um, were, of course, struck by fear and foreboding, but they had no idea, really, most of them, what exactly was in store for them. Uh, curiously, or um, that's quite the right word, there were not that many young Jews there, young male Jews present, because there had earlier been this uh, fear that the Germans had announced forced labor for men. And so, Generally, the young Jewish men had fled earlier, and this led behind the older people, children, and women. So that's overwhelmingly who would be seized, as over a thousand of these Jews would be seized that day. Um, the, as the morning uh, progressed, uh, passes by increasingly. Uh, were struck by, got to witness what was happening. So we'll see, the Pope would learn very early by 7 a.m. that morning what was going on. Uh, and I think it's a representation of this. This isn't an actual photographs, but a rep later representation. Um, in the ghetto, the Jews, those many of you have probably been to Rome and been to the ghetto area, uh, the Jews were, were marched to the Roman theater, or Marcellus, uh, which is right behind the Gran Tempio, the major synagogue in the ghetto area. And from there, there were trucks, tarpaulin-covered trucks that would ferry them to the, where they would be held for the next two days at a military college across the Tiber, right next to Vatican City. Literally a stone's throw from Vatican City. Some succeeded in escaping, mourned by the shouts of neighbors, Others simply froze in fear. Just to give one example, uh, Rose, Ro Rose Anticoli fled her home with four little children, um, but unfortunately for her, one of her children was uh, sick with actually diphtheria, slowing her down. So as she was slowed down, she was trying to make her way to the tram to get out of the area. A suspicious SS officer spotted her and yelled, you there, you there, Jew. And seized her, she fell to her knees, pleaded on behalf of her children with him. He just prodded her with the butt of his rifle and marched her uh, into the line that would lead to the trucks, taking her to the military college, where she would eventually be with uh, a total of about 1,260 Jews who were rounded up that day between the ghetto and other parts of Rome. The Trauma would, in fact, cause one of the women to go into labor the day they were taken so that there would be an additional imprisoned Jew the next day um, who would only live a week, as it turned out. 
Well, as I mentioned, Pius XII very quickly learned of what was going on. And again, there he is. And certainly the news was distressing to him. He knew what was going to happen to these Jews. He was well aware of the, of the death camps and, and the uh, ongoing murder of the Jews of Europe further north. Uh, to make matters worse for him, the, having the Jews of Rome rounded up and held within stone's throw of the Vatican was deeply embarrassing to him because he had already been under great pressure to be denouncing the uh, attempts of the, the Germans to exterminate Europe's Jews. And uh, now having Rome's Jews, Rome's Jews, in fact, the title of my chapter in this book dealing with it um, is called The Pope's Jews because the popes uh, regarded the Jews as under their protection. I mean, this is a bit ironic because the popes had uh, for hundreds of years confined Jews to a ghetto and uh, where they were very limited in many ways. But at the same time, this was represented as per the popes protecting the Jews of Rome. So um, the pope uh, picks up his phone and calls his number two, his sec cardinal secretary of state. Uh, his name is Malione. There he is, Cardinal Luigi Malione, and says to him, you know, call in the German ambassador to the Holy See. Uh, you know, we've got to do something. Luckily, uh, and this actually was published in those 12 volumes I showed earlier, so this is not a new discovery, uh, Maglioni himself recorded the conversation he would have that day with the German ambassador, Ernst von Weizsäcker, who himself is an important figure. He'd been um, the Secretary of State in uh, Germany until he had been appointed just a few months earlier uh, ambassador, German ambassador to the Holy See. And so uh, what I'm going to give you is their conversation that they would have that day as the Jews were still being rounded up that morning or that afternoon on October 16th. So the cardinal invokes the ambassador's sense of Christian charity and humanity, asked if he might not intervene to stop the uh, arrest of all the Jews of Rome, the attempted arrest. And Weizsäcker replies with a question all these quotes, again, are from the Cardinal's own recounting of this conversation. Weizsäcker says, what would the Holy See do if things were to continue? And Malion and the Cardinal responds, the Holy See would not want to be constrained to say a word of disapproval. And the ambassador, the German ambassador, responds, it has been more than four years that I have been following and admiring the Holy See's attitude. It has succeeded in steering the ship amidst rocks of every kind and every size without any collisions. And even if it had more faith in the allies, it has known how to maintain a perfect balance. I ask myself whether right at the time that the boat is about to reach port, is it a good idea to put everything in danger? I think of the consequences that a step of the Holy See would provoke. The instructions, he says, the German ambassador tells the cardinal, the instructions received come from the highest source. So he leaves the um, cardinal to reflect on this obvious reference to Hitler as having ordered the roundup of the Jews of Europe. Did he really want to protest an order that came from Hitler himself? So Weizsäcker then says, does your eminence leave me free not to report this official conversation? And Malione then says, and again, this is Malione's own account, says, I observed that I had asked him to intervene by appealing to his sense of humanity. I left it to his judgment whether or not to mention our conversation, which had been so friendly. Malione uh, went on to assure the German ambassador that, as he had himself stated, the Holy See, the Vatican, had always been careful not to give the German people the impression of having done, quote, even the least thing against Germany during a terrible war, unquote. Meanwhile, the Cardinal concluded, again, these are his words as he recounts them, I repeat, Your Excellency, Your Excellency told me that he would do something for the poor Jews. He actually did not say that. I thank you for it. As for the rest, I leave it to your judgment. If you think it more opportune not to mention our conversation, so be it. There is a von Weizsäcker who would be, be um, on trial with the war crimes tribunal after the war. By the way, his son would become Richard, as some of you may know, uh, president of West Germany after the war. 
Well, as I say, Weizsäcker never promised he was going to do anything on behalf of the Jews and certainly didn't do anything. What he did do is inform Berlin the next day that the Curia was, quote, in his report to Berlin, he said, they were particularly shocked that the action took place, so to speak, under the Pope's windows. And he, um, that group, he said groups hostile to the Germans were trying to exploit the roundup, again, this quote, from uh, his correspondence with Berlin to force the Vatican out of its reserve. And he added that the people were beginning to contrast the silence and timidity of Pope Pius XII with uh, the, his, what he says, quote, his much more fiery predecessor, Pius XI, which we could talk about later, the, this difference between Pius XI and Pius XII. Again, Pius XI died in February of 39. Pius XII becomes pope uh, the next month, March. Meanwhile, at the military college, the Jews were forced to sleep on the floor. They were given no, no food or drink. Um, they, of course, couldn't sleep between the, the stench from the lack of lavatories and the lack of food, the hunger, uh, the, the fear. And all wondered what would become of them Although most assumed that, or could only imagine that some kind of work camp might be in their future, although many hoped they would be returned to home. Few realized uh, the fate that actually would await them. And here I have a map, again, I'm sure many of you have been to Rome, um, but there I've pointed out, I don't know if you can make out the Tiber River, which you know, winds around there. You have on the left side uh, where the Vatican is, uh, below it, Trastevere. And what I pointed to is at the top, the Apostolic Palace where the Pope lived in the middle of Vatican City, and an arrow going to the military college where the Jews were held. So you see this is literally next door to the Vatican. Well, as the thousand, uh, more than thousand terrified Jews waited a few hundred meters from the Vatican, please kept coming into the Pope to do something. On the day after the roundup, for example, Pius XII received an urgent letter from a group of Roman Jews who had eluded capture, begging him to intervene. That same day, he received a letter that an elderly Jewish woman had, who was actually captured had somehow snuck out of the military college, again begging him to take action. Um, at the same time, a number of other Roman Jews reached the Vatican Secretary of State office to plead for papal help on behalf of family members who had been seized. That morning, Monsignor Montini, a name that might be familiar to some of you because he was a Deputy Secretary of State at the time. He would later uh, become Pope Paul VI. Um, it was, he's the one who ordered those 12 volumes, for example, to be published later on. Uh, the Deputy Secretary of State, um, had obtained permission from the Germans to send a uh, emissary to, uh, to that military college to see what the situation was. He learned uh, how uh, desperate their condition was there. Uh, doctors were coming out. In fact, as he came in, they had attended to some of the, the um, injured Jews who had been beaten um, uh, as part of their arrest. But he learned something of interest from speaking to those mill milling around outside the a military college, and in his report back to Montini, he says, it seems, according to some who were outside and knew people interned there, that they also included people who had already been baptized, confirmed, and celebrated a church wedding. This would be very important, as it turns out. And in fact, among those who had been seized, there were quite a few who uh, had been baptized. There were Jews who had been baptized. Um, and there were also quite a few Jewish, of uh, the Jewish men there, quite a few had married Catholic women and had had Catholic weddings, and which meant they pledged to have their children baptized and raised as Catholics. Within, within hours of the arrests, uh, pleas kept or began coming in to the Pope to do something about these Catholics and these Jewish men married to Catholics with uh, Catholic children. Uh, at 7 a.m., the morning of the arrests, as they were being arrested, uh, an employee of the Vatican Library learned of the plight of his relatives who had been taken earlier in the morning. 
uh, he rushed to the Vatican and he, was, he uh, knew Montini, although he couldn't, uh, he didn't find Montini, he left a note for him, and which we now have access to. He wrote, I turn to your excellency with the, utmost fer with the most fervent prayer to use your authority with the German embassy so that Catholic people and fervent Catholics like my aunt and my cousins are saved. It is an intervention that cannot come quickly enough if, God willing, it is not already too late. This would be probably the first uh, specific request on behalf of baptized Jews to get them freed that would come to the, the Pope. At the same time, Monsignor Montini learned of another such case, and he wrote a hasty note to uh, his boss, the Vatican Secretary of State, we saw a moment ago, Cardinal uh, Luigi Malione. He wrote, this morning, the lawyer Foligno was taken, Catholic by birth with his Aryan wife and children. A note three days later reported the good news. Again, we find in these newly opened archives, Mr. Foligno comes to the Secretariat to give thanks for what has been done for him. He was liberated after only a few hours, unquote. In fact, the day after uh, the roundup, the Office of the Order of Malta advised the Vatican Secretary of State of another such case. Although the man in question had a Jewish father, the letter explained, he had been baptized at shortly after birth, yet he had been seized in the German raid. Three days later, the Office of the Order of Malta, again, these are documents in the newly opened archives of the Vatican, uh, the Office of the Order of Malta sent a letter reporting that the Germans, quote, error had been rectified, quote, Fortunately for him, before embarking for an unknown destination, he was let go, unquote. In fact, the Secretary, Secretary of State of the Vatican had hastily drawn up a list of those among the imprisoned whom the church deemed Catholic and given the list to the German ambassador. Early on Sunday, this is the day after the uh, roundup of the Jews, so now October 17th, the Germans began carefully reviewing the Catholic credentials of the people they had taken to determine if any uh, Christians had erroneously fallen into their net. Over the next hours, they would not only release those who uh, could prove their baptismal credentials, but, and this initially surprised me, but also those uh, I referred to before, the Jewish men who had married Catholic women with church-approved weddings and had Catholic children. Therefore, um, how do you explain this? Um, well, partly, you know, this was Rome, and the Germans did not want to unduly uh, offend the uh, Vatican or provoke the, the Pope. Beginning at dawn, a second day, Monday, October 18th, the remaining 1,020 Jews, so about 250 had been able to, uh, were released, many because of the process I mentioned. Some, there was also a handful who uh, could show they were citizens of countries of um, uh, neutral nations. If they were Jewish citizens of neutral nations, they would be let go. But again, that was a small number. So uh, 1,020 of the remaining, the remaining Jews were put on a truck that morning, Monday morning, October 18th, rumbling across the cobblestone streets of Rome on their destination to a, a train, a freight train that was waiting for them eight, with 18 freight cars, windowless freight cars. And hours later, it would finally pull out. As it went, made its way north, witnesses at Bologna and further north uh, along the train path in Italy could hear the plaintive cries coming from its forlorn human freight that same day, Monsignor Montini met with Pius XII to ask how he should reply to a letter that relatives of the captured Jews had sent the previous day pleading for the Pope to intervene. He, uh, the Pope says, uh, let them know that one is doing everything that one can, unquote. The day after the trainload of Jews left, a member of the Vatican Secretary of State office handed the German ambassador to the Vatican, we saw before, Ernst von Weizsäcker, 
the latest uh, Vatican list of those who had been seized who should have been considered Catholics, not Jews. Quote in this, uh, this letter to the German ambassador, they write, among the various cases of non-Aryans not previously made known to the German embassy, there are the two attached. They involve non-Aryans who have been baptized but not freed as others have been in their condition, unquote. Well, it was still dark uh, the following Saturday, so it was exactly a week after the Jews were, were seized in Rome, when the train arrived at Auschwitz, its destination. There, they were met by this man, Josef Mengele, uh, Dr. Josef Mengele, and as they got out of the train, the um, families that had been divided, you know, desperately were looking for you know, their wives, their husbands, their children. Uh, but he announced anybody who moved would be shot and then proceeded with his selection, where on one side he put all the children, the elderly, those who seemed too fragile to do heavy labor. And, uh, and this was by far the largest group. And then the other side, uh, the much smaller group of mainly uh, men with also some women who would be sent to the work camp. The larger group would be of the, these women, children, elderly, uh, were put onto trucks and sent directly to the gas chambers. The youngest murder victim we've already met, he was born the previous Sunday um, in the military college. Of the 1,020 Jews who had been put on the train to Rome, only 16 would return alive. And I just wanted to show a couple of pictures because there's a, this human element, one can also talk about this at a level of abstraction, but just to put faces, a couple of faces on this. This is one of the women with her uh, child who was put on that train and would die at Auschwitz along with her child or a couple of the children who were taken and would be immediately sent to the gas chamber um, that, that Saturday. On the day the Jews were being forced onto the train in Rome, October 18th, Francis Darcy Osborne, the British envoy to the Holy See, had a long audience with Pope Pius XII. And so we have his report of his audience with the Pope, in, which we found in London, he says he appeared, quote, well and in good spirits. Uh, the Pope shared with him two concerns, neither of which had to do with Jews, who weren't mentioned. Um, Osborne asked the Pope whether the Germans were treating the Vatican well. He replied, quote, this is according to Osborne's report that we find in the London archives. He had no grounds for complaint against Ger General von Stahel, who's the head of the German military in uh, Rome and the German police who had hitherto respected neutrality, unquote. And in fact, to understand the Pope's actions that day, you have to understand exactly that, that this was, um, the Germans were occupying Rome and the Pope was concerned to protect Vatican City and church institutions in Rome and um, maintaining good relations with the, Vatican, with the German military was uh, very important to him. Pleas from Rome's Jews kept coming into the Pope on the 27th of October, a Roman rabbi, uh, David Panzieri, wrote directly to the Pope begging him to convince the Germans to return the victims of the October 16th roundup to their families, unaware that most had already been gassed and incinerated. Yet the Vatican's main focus in the days following the roundup remained uh, that of trying to free the Catholics, the Jewish converts who had been mistakenly, from their point of view, taken. Um, so on October 29th, for example, Cardinal, so they, the Pope, they would only learn later about the, the fact that most of these people had been murdered immediately. So they, as far as they knew, they were still alive in some kind of concentration camp. So October 29th, Cardinal Malione office, his office sent Weizsacker, the German ambassador, a typical appeal. Quote, the most excellent German ambassador to the Holy See is asked for his benevolent interest in the release of Count Victor Cantoni and his mother, who were deported by the German troops from Rome, where they live to an unknown destination. Count Cantoni, Catholic, 
who was baptized 30 years ago as a child and his mother was baptized in 1927, unquote. A week later, writing on behalf of all those who had been arrested that day, Malione sent a letter to the German ambassador. He asked if it were possible for him to satisfy what he referred to as the many relatives or friends of the non-Aryans recently arrested in Rome who would like to have news of their loved ones and eventually to have some material help, unquote. At the same time, the German ambassador to the Vatican, uh, Weizsäcker, sent the welcome news to Berlin uh, about the Pope's reaction to the roundup of the Jews. There he is again. So this is now from the uh, German archives, the Weizsäcker's report to um, von Ribbentrop and Hitler. Although he has been beseeched by various parties to do so, the Pope has refrained from making any ostentatious remarks on the deportation of the Jews from Rome. Even though he must expect to be criticized for this for a long time by our enemies, and Protestant circles in Anglo-Saxon countries will exploit this for propaganda purposes, on this issue too, he has done everything possible not to strain relations with the German government and the German authorities in Rome." Unquote. The Pope's silence as the Jews of Rome were being sent to their death was so striking, and this was one of the kind of documents that most uh, amazed me, that the, uh, the German priest who was serving as the chaplain to the SS forces in Rome complained to the Italian priest who served as chaplain to the Roman police force, saying that you know, some of uh, the SS were unhappy about their assignment of rounding up the Jews knowing where they were sending them, and were amazed that neither the uh, Pope nor any church officials had uh, spoken out against it. Well, over the following months of the German occupation of Rome, another thousand Jews about would be seized and sent to their death. They, of course, the Jews went into hiding after this in Rome and some protected in convents and other uh, Catholic religious or, um, um, institutions. But close to another thousand would be uh, captured anyway. They, uh, the Germans offered a bounty to Italians who would turn them in, and many did. Um, and um, of course, thousands more from further north in, in uh, German-occupied Italy would be sent to their death in those months as well. Pius XII still judged it best not to speak out. Among other reasons for his silence, I gave one a moment ago about uh, protecting Vatican City uh, and church institutions in Rome. Uh, but he was also aware that, I mean, who were the Germans? Who were, who were murdering all these Jews? They were not people who thought they were pagans. They were people who regarded themselves as Christians, Catholics and Protestants. And he was worried, the Pope was worried about creating a split a schism in the Catholic Church in Germany if he were to denounce uh, what the German army and the German SS, the German government was doing. Um, and so as a result, I decided to write this book. Thank you. You indicated uh, in your part of your presentation that a group of Jews or Catholics who'd been, Jews who'd been baptized were released and you didn't know exactly the reason why they were all released. And could it be the reason perhaps of the Nuremberg Laws where to be Jewish you had to have three or four Jewish grandparents. If you had less you would be defined as Mischling or neither Jewish nor German, sort of a a non-state. Right. So the, um, the situation in Italy and Germany uh, were different. So as you say, in, in Germany, there was this distinction of the Michelings who were, had one Christian parent, one Jewish parent, who, by the way, um, would generally escape death. It was only at the very end of the war that they would be sent to, to the, the concentration camps. So they were, although they were discriminated against, were to an extent protected. What's interesting in the Italian case, though, well, that it wasn't just the, the Michelings who were baptized, um, but it was also people who, didn't, who had Jewish parents, 
And also, as I mentioned, Jews who were married to Catholics. Um, and so you know, that, that was what was different about the situation, I think, in Italy versus Germany. Of course, you have to also understand, uh, I've been working since I finished this book on Italy's uh, racial laws, which began in 1938, the anti-Semitic laws. And there they had um, their own ideas about the, who is part of the Aryan race versus the Jewish race. I mean, now we kind of think it's um, almost comical about you know, Italians as fashioning themselves as members of a pure Aryan race as opposed to a Jewish race. But um, there, if you had a Catholic parent, a Jewish parent, and you were baptized before the imposition of the racial laws, you were considered of the Aryan race. If you had one Catholic parent, one Jewish parent, but you were baptized a day after the racial laws, you were considered of the Jewish race. Uh, but that's a little bit different than what was going on that day. Hi. Hi. Did the archives reveal anything about the Pope's involvement in helping German war criminals escape <laughs> after the war? Yeah, so the, um, there's been a lot of attention, a lot of interest in the um, so-called rat line of, that was established to help German war criminals escape generally to South America more than any other place by being given false identity papers and so on. And um, the recent opening of archives have shed some new light on this. The uh, best, if anybody's interested, the uh, most important researcher in this area, uh, Gerald Steinacker, wrote a book, uh, Nazis on the Run, published a number of years ago that's very good on this rat line. And he's been working in these newly opened Vatican archives. So I'm kind of looking forward to his uh, updated book on this, but we know that um, some fairly high up in uh, the church in Rome, most especially the head of the German church in Rome, Bishop uh, Alois uh, Hudal, played an active role in providing false identity papers to Nazi war criminals to help them escape. I have the mic, so uh, thank you very much. It's wonderful to have you here. But here's my question. If you could take us back to the beginning of the two regimes, Mussolini's Italy and Hitler's Germany, and how they come to power, the classic understanding is that Mussolini comes to power with a coup, and Hitler comes to power as, quote, democratically elected. Um, is there a paradox in the way they come to power and their anti-Semitic policies in the first years of the two regimes? Well, and wait, one more final question. What does it tell us about fascism that we need to know today? Oh. Uh, <laughs> well, in fact, they both come to power legally, in a formal sense anyway. I mean, the difference in, in the Italian cases was there was the ragtag uh, fascist uh, forces in their famous march on Rome, but that could have been put down easily and almost was uh, until the Pope put a, uh, excuse me, until the um, king, uh, countermanded the order that the government wanted to put out to have the troops stop it. And so the king appoints uh, Mussolini in, um, in the fall of 1922 to be prime minister and form a government. So it was, you know, from that point of view, legal in the same way that Hitler in January 33 was appointed, um, appointed head of the government. In terms of the anti-Semitism at the beginning, I mean, this is, of course, a big difference between Nazi Germany and, and fascist Italy. Uh, fascist, so obviously Nazi Germany from day one or before day one uh, was um, anti uh, Judaism, anti Semitism was a key element of the uh, Nazi movement in the government. But this was not true of uh, Mussolini's fascism, which uh, in, in most of its uh, ventennia, most of its 20 year history, in fact, had Jewish office holders fairly high up. Made, a number of the mayors of major Italian cities, uh, fascist mayors, were, were Jewish. At least one minister of the center, central government was Jewish. Uh, and probably as high a proportion of Jews in Italy were members of the fascist party as you know, Catholics in Italy, all of which is, of course, inconceivable in, in Germany. So these were very different. Um, the, in terms of I mean, this, the lessons of fascism, the, well, one thing, you know, I, I asked, uh, fairly often by people say, well, you're an expert on Mussolini. Um, what can you tell us about Trump and you know, what's going on? <laughs> and well, my usual response is, uh, first of all, I find the um, comparison unfair to Mussolini. Um, <laughs> but for reasons I could talk about. But aside from that, um, the, I, what it, I, I respond by saying it's really kind of more that what I see happening in the US recently helps me understand how Mussolini came to power.
uh, and the attraction of the strong man uh, and the demonization of the other and so forth. So, um, so I think there are, there are lessons that go kind of in both ways there. Why did the Italian government allow the German army in Italy in the first place? Thank you. Yeah, well, it depends what the first place is. So the, in that, well, the question is, why, one question might be, why did Mussolini, why did he join the war? He didn't join the war initially. So we generally date the beginning of World War I to the German um, invasion of Poland on September 1st, 1939. And there were some expectations that with the alliance uh, and all the bellicose rhetoric of Mussolini, uh, the Axis alliance, that Mussolini would join the war immediately, which he didn't. When does he join the war? He joins the war, announced it June 10th, 1940. Well, he only joins the war after what seemed incredible happened, namely that the Germans were able to just roll in throughout Western Europe in a matter of weeks. I mean, it was supposed to be this impregnable Maginot line and so on protecting France. The Germans just go you know, march on Paris seem, seemingly without any trouble at all. They've taken over, um, or would shortly, the Balkans, the North Africa. Um, so it was only when it looked to Mussolini that Hitler was going to win the war and uh, be the ruler of Western Europe that he decided to join the war. At this point, um, well, then later on, as uh, things begin to turn around in terms of uh, the fate of the war, and as the Allies are, are threatening to invade, so you know, after the U.S. joins the war, and then the, uh, the um, American forces, along with British, uh, invade, or Americans join the British in North Africa um, in, uh, in 42, the, um, he becomes, Mussolini becomes increasingly nervous, and so he actually calls on the Germans. And, and throughout this, by the way, the Allies are bombing major cities of, of Italy. Uh, so he needs protection. And so he turns to the Germans to help uh, protect him. And so this is how German troops, even while Mussolini is still in power, begin to come in. So even before the armistice, and this is part of, of course, the problem that the, uh, when, when the king decides to remove Mussolini from power, July 25th, 1943, so the Allies have landed in Sicily a couple weeks before that, on the 10th. Um, he, um, you know, the problem is how to get out of the war because they have, they're fighting alongside Germans in, in Italy, but also in, in North Africa, in, um, in Russia, in the Balkans. And uh, how does he announce all of a sudden that uh, he's you know, no longer, um, he's making peace with the Allies? So, you know, this is the, the general context in which uh, the Germans are able to, to flood into, um, into Italy. And right from the day that Mussolini is overthrown, Hitler has absolutely no faith in this uh, temporary new Italian government. And despite what they say, which is that their alliance with the Germans would continue, he didn't believe it and was making um, preparations to send in the German army to occupy Italy. So we have a few questions from home. Um, can you speak about the totalitarian tendency, tendencies of the church and how these parallel to totalitarian slash fascist governments in Italy and Germany? Well, Pius XI kind of famously said, there's only one totalitarian institution. It's not the Italian fascist state, it's the Roman Catholic Church. And um, in fact, so that you know, there's some number of historians, not all, but who would refer to the fascist regime as a clerico-fascist regime. It was based uh, on, a, um, on a kind of deal made between the Vatican, Pius XI, and Mussolini, which, among other things, established Vatican City, which didn't exist before as a sovereign uh, state, and ended separation of church and state in Italy. But, um, but there was always a certain amount of tension between the church and, uh, and the Vatican in the fascist regime, and of course with the German regime even more in that. Um, but in Italy, from the point of view of the Vatican, it was the totalitarian institution, that is the institution that should be first and foremost the allegiance of the people was the Catholic Church, uh, who should decide their morals and decide what's good and bad and what's appropriate behavior, what's not appropriate behavior, not the fascist regime. So despite the fact there was this close alliance, there was also always a certain amount of tension. 
uh, and again in Germany even more so, where I mean, people often uh, seem to talk about the relationship of the Vatican or the Church and the fascist regimes, well, meaning uh, Germany and, and Italy, uh, but there were totally different situations. In Italy, um, there was a alliance between the fascist regime, now I'm talking about the 20s and 30s, the war years are a uh, somewhat different story, uh, but there, there was an alliance between the two. The fascist regime, um, you know, they began every meeting uh, with a, uh, a mass, and they, uh, every fascist group had its um, chaplains, Catholic priest chaplains, and so forth. Uh, whereas in Germany, the, um, and this is, by the way, why Hitler was so eager to send his secret emissary to Pius XII, because his predecessor, Pius XI, had been increasingly criticizing the Germans for the persecution of the Catholic Church in Germany, closing down uh, Catholic seminaries and convents uh, and closing down uh, parochial schools is because Hitler only wanted uh, kids to go to state schools where they could be tur you know, turned into good Nazis uh, and didn't want them going to Catholic schools where in Catholic parts of Germany most kids had been going. So, yeah, this is uh, the kind of distinction between the two. Please join me in thanking Professor Kurtzer for a very fascinating lecture. Thank you so much.